Okay, so before I get started on the next bit, so I apologize I didn't get as far as I had hoped to last time. And then, of course, one thing that you maybe should have noticed is that I focus more on the ideas and less on the specific problems. This will happen. We don't have time to do 23 examples of each possible problem, so I want to convey to you in the course the ideas, and I'm happy to do them in specific problems, but hopefully the idea, the, the plan is we'll understand the concepts and then figure out how to apply them in the context of the problems. Another comment I want to make, you should have received a solar message, and I guess a few people are late because they misunderstood the solar message, which is that, not today, but next Monday, the recitation has moved from heavy engineering to you on the second floor of this building. So that means you don't have to truck across the campus to get to your recitation. It's, I think, 217, is that the number? Yeah. So it's now in, in I-217 and not over in heavy engineering. Sorry? He's asking if that's just for once or forever. That's correct. It's moved there, that's where it will be. Um, precisely because it's kind of stupid for it to be on the other side of the campus. So I could have asked them to move it to the hospital, but... Yeah. Um, okay, so there's that. So, uh, I will give you a choice since you just did. So, one thing at the end of the, so another thing, I put the video up. It's in, but it works. So you can see if it works or not. Use it if you don't. This one will probably be up in maybe two days. It takes a lot of computer time to crunch the video into something that's usable. Um, or not usable, at least you know, plays on the computer. Um, as it comes out of there, it's about ten times the size that it needs to be. Uh, and I don't think you want to download ten gig of video for each class. Um, okay, so there's that. There's something new. Uh, last time when I was talking about so if you have homework, you wind up in this pile at some time in the near future. Um, so last time, as you probably noticed, I didn't really go heavily over the idea of projection and so on. I ended the class, I wrote the wrong formula on the board because I forgot about one thing. So I want to pick up from there. Most of you probably figured it out because it was required to do some of the homework problems. And you did the homework problems or you didn't and consequently you read the book or you didn't. So I want to pick up from there unless everybody tells me I got it, I don't need to hear about it. Nobody's going to say that. <laughs> you got it, you came to my office, so you got it. Right? What did no, you say that? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so at the end of the last class, I was talking about, we have a vector, let's use the same note, no, I'm not going to use the same note. I have some vector, what do I want to call it, C. And I have some vector, W. And I want to compute, in some sense, if I draw a right angle here, I want to compute either this vector or its length. And then you also had a homework problem, and this I didn't quite get to, this vector as well. So this red vector here is called the projection of C in the direction of W. It has other names too. Uh, in, in some contexts, it's called the its length is called the length is sometimes called the component. of this vector C in the W direction, and so on. So there's various names for this sort of thing, but it, it also is useful. So I drew it parallel to the x-axis, but it's certainly useful, say, in the context of a physics problem, where C is representing some force, 
and you want to know how much of this force is being applied in the direction, in a certain direction. So you might have, in a physics context, you might have some hill, and there's a force due to gravity, and you want to know how much of that force goes this way, or something like that. So that's the same kind of thing, right? We're going to project this gravitational force onto the direction of the hill, so we can figure out what piece of that is being contributed in that direction. So, but another context is if we have, we want to change coordinate vector, change coordinates somehow. I have two coordinate systems. I have my original coordinate system, and I have some new coordinate system here. And I have some vector in the green coordinate system, which I know in terms of x and y. And I want to express this vector in the new, well, it's black. I'll use the black coordinate system. In the black coordinate system, in terms of some, let's call it u and v. So I might want to change coordinates from the xy space to the uv space. And this is a, a big piece of linear algebra it has to do with coordinate changes. But this is another, these are the same question, really. And so finding the component of this in that direction is just sort of telling me how to express this thing, which didn't move the green thing, in a new, in a new coordinate system. Okay, so I didn't calculate this. I sort of did it at the end of the last class. You did it on the homework, or you didn't, one or the other. Maybe you understood what you were doing on the homework. Maybe you didn't. I don't know. Should I do it? Should I assume you all understood it? All right. Then we'll just never get anywhere. Okay. Um, okay. So at the end of the last class, so let's, I'm going to redraw this picture. So here's my W, this is the long guy, here's C, and the reason I use C is so that I can think of this as a triangle ABC, and the angle between A and C is theta, and we certainly know that the cosine of theta is the length of A, no, what am I doing? Yeah, that's right. Is the length of A over the length of C, or in other words, the length of A is C cosine theta. And these are vectors I'm going to probably forget what the error for was. So this is one way to express the length of A, but we also know that we can calculate the cos the cosine of an angle between two vectors using the dot product. So we also know that the cosine of theta is the length of A, the length of C times A dot C. Let me just not draw it. Right? So we take the dot product of. Oh, no. No. Yeah, so no. Yeah. Sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry. I'm just writing garbage. A C cosine theta. And we have this equals that, so we can see here, we can easily calculate A dot C, and what we want is the length of A, so that means that the length of A here is length of C cosine theta, which is the same as A dot C, except I have an extra A over there. No, extra C. No, what am I doing? <laughs> I have an extra A. This is not what I wanted. Oh, duh. Sorry. I want W here. I want W here because this is something I know. Sorry. Okay, so W dot C is certainly the length of W, the length of C times the cosine of the angle between them. But what I want is A. So what I want is C cosine theta. So the length of A is certainly going to be W C 
cosine theta divided by w because length of a is c cosine theta. And sorry I confused myself, but that happens. Which is easily calculated because that is w dot c. We know w, we know c. And then we have to divide by the length of w. So that tells us the length of this red vector. Another way you could view this same question, which is sort of the way the book describes it, is I could think of making w into a unit vector. And if w is a unit vector, so I could make some new vector, which the book calls n. I think that is an unfortunate choice, because n usually means normal. So I'm going to call it u which is just the vector w divided by its length. So this is a vector of length 1, which I guess in this picture I've run out of colors, so I'll make it black, dotted. There it is. So this is u. Which is just w stretched back to be of length 1. And then this, pro this cal calculation which doesn't depend on anything about w except its direction, because we divide by the length here, becomes simpler. Because first I unitize w into u. And so when I take the dot product of u with, with c, it doesn't contribute any extra junk that I have to divide away. So this is also the same as just u dotted with c. And this is a number. All of these are numbers, right? If I want it to be a vector, like this red vector here, then I have to make it into a vector. So I could also say that the vector A is the vector U dotted with C. That's a number. And then I put it in the U direction. Or if I don't want to think about u, I could also do the calculation exactly the same. What is that line? I don't know. It's exactly the same as saying it's w dotted with c divided by the length of w, that's a number, times the vector w, but I want to unitize it, so I'll square it. Or I could put another w over here. So either this is all the same. And then this vector, which I guess I call B in the picture, which is the component of C in the other direction, I can just do by subtracting C minus this vector A. So in that picture, the vector B is just well, I take C, and I throw away the part in the A <coughs> So rather, I can go through an example of this if you want with actual numbers. None of this depends on whether it's in the plane or in 17-dimensional space. All of these calculations are completely vectors or scalars. So it doesn't matter how many dimensions we're doing here. This is all the same. Right? Because once you have two vectors, you have a plane that they live in, and so it doesn't matter whether this sticks out of the board or however many dimensions it's in. Any questions on this at all? Do you want me to do an example? You all did examples on the homework, so I'm just reminding you what you did in the homework. If the way you did the homework is to flip through the chapter, find the formula, plug it in, there you go. Because I know that I talked to two people today that's what they did, and I went through this kind of a discussion with them to, I don't know that, but anyway, I did. So, there's that. Uh, right. Oh, crap, no. Sorry. I thought, I, I mean, I brought the notes from a meeting I went to rather than the notes I brought them up. Okay, let's come back to now I mean, it's related, but it's not quite the same. I want to return to the idea of calculating, of writing equations for lines and planes and so on. 
So we certainly saw one way to describe let's say a plane, well, a line is just we take some point on the, we, we take here's a line, here's the axes, here's a point on the line, I take a vector to any point on the line, and then I add to that vector t times some vector, some vector that I can stretch. So I can describe this line as this line L is all points of the form A plus T times B. That's certainly one way I can describe a line. And then we can generalize this to a plane or a hyperplane. So here's a plane. Here's my origin. I take some point on the plane. I take a vector to that point. And now I have to add two vectors. Well, that's a terrible one. This vector and, say, this vector, where this is a vector, again, A. It should be a P, actually, but whatever. And this is some U, and this is some B. And I can describe everything in this plane by saying get to the plane and then take some combination of U's and V's to move around in the plane. So I can describe this plane as vectors whose endpoint lives at A plus some scalar times V plus another scalar times U, and so on. Okay? But I can also describe this in another way, which sort of unifies this concept a little bit. And, and uh, before I do that, uh, and I'm not supposed to walk oh, well. Sorry. I have to get used to that. <laughs> I have to remember where I can stand, and then my life is easier because then there's less editing of the video. Um, so, and we can generalize this to, let's call it a hyperplane, let's call it a three plane. Something of the form A plus T times V plus S times U plus R times W, and so on. And somebody last time asked about this, said this plane isn't flat. Is it? Yeah, well, okay. So you and I were using different, content, con different <coughs> meanings of the word flat. Your meaning of the word flat is like a tabletop, and my meaning of the word flat was not curved. So this is not a curved space, so I say it's flat. But it's not flat like I can ride a bicycle on it. So there's two different meanings of the word flat. One means a two-dimensional flat surface, and that's usually what people use in the word in English to describe a plane. And another meaning, which is a more geometrical, more mathematically generalized thing, is not bent, not curved. And when I said, sure this is flat, of course it's flat, I meant it's not a curved space. So, so well, okay, so let me just shut up about that. Okay. So it's flat and it's not flat. And if you didn't understand that, that's it. So I want to come back to this idea of plane and say, how else could we describe a plane or how else could we describe a line in a way that is sort of the same? Here you can see the generalization from a, a place on the plane and moving around on the line. We can think of a line like a one-dimensional plane. I mean, in the sense that it's a one-dimensional object where you can move around in one direction. And then this guy is a two-plane, probably in three space. And maybe it's in seven space, but whatever. And then this guy is a three-plane. Well, I already wrote the word three-plane, so I don't have to write it again. And we can generalize this to a 12-plane or whatever. We take a, a, a starting place on the plane, and then some combination of directions in those higher dimensional spaces, and that will certainly describe for us a higher dimensional object. Um, 
you might think, let me make an aside, let me get away from what I'm saying for a minute. You might think that that would be silly. Why do we need to describe a five-dimensional plane-like object? But a lot of times, we do have five dimensions of freedom that scale, scale linearly. And we need to describe those objects. Um, so, for example, you might be trying to describe um, position and velocity of a particle. Well, that will be in space, that will be six dimensions. Right? I have three dimensions to describe the position and another three components to describe the velocity, that will be a six-dimensional thing. I have six numbers to describe the position and velocity of a particle. Now, they are subject usually to certain laws of motion, so that will come back down. You know, we have conservation of momentum, and we have, conservation, we have all sorts of conservation laws, but inherently that's a six-dimensional object. Or maybe if you're describing uh, some inputs from a pair of joysticks, that's four dimensions there. I have two, two forward note directions, I can move this forward and this back. So if I want to describe, I have a pair of joysticks that are going to move something around, that's four dimensions. And they, that position will depend linearly on those four inputs. And so on. So I have many contexts in which you encounter multi-dimensional spaces that you don't usually draw, you know, as geometrical objects like this. And there may be some restrictions on it, maybe. You know, maybe we have some conservation laws that constrain that motion. But still, there are, there are many places in which you will encounter higher dimensional than three things. And it doesn't mean they're not real. It just doesn't mean they describe things that you build a sculpture out of. Okay, so back to this. I want to generalize this notion a little bit. And let's just start with a line in a plane and let's try and think of, so here's a line. And I can describe this line, well, I can describe the direction of this line either by giving a vector this way, but I can also describe it in terms of the complementary direction, this one. And okay, that doesn't seem like I bought anything. I've traded one vector for another. But if you think about a plane, that's not a rhombus, it's a plane. It's flying up in space. Here, I, the things on the plane, oops, I want them to match in color. The things on the plane, I can describe it as a combination of these two vectors living in the plane, but I can also say it's all the stuff perpendicular to that. And now you see there's a lot of consistency here. This line, so the line is the stuff, so I need a point here too, but, so it's the stuff which is parallel to the black vector, which is the same as the stuff perpendicular to the green vector. And this is called a normal vector. So it's all the points in the plane that are parallel to the black vector and pass through a given point, or perpendicular to the green vector and pass through a given point. And here the plane we can do in the same way. It's all the stuff which is a combination of the black vector. But we can also look in the complementary dimension and see that this is the same as the stuff that is perpendicular to the normal vector. We can describe it either by describing what it is, 
or we're describing what it's not. Right here, we're, the black is describing what it is, how you build it. You go to some place on the plane with our position vector, and then you move in some combination of the black. That's describing what it is. Or we can describe it by saying go to some place on the plane and move in any direction that isn't that. So I can describe this floor as saying I can get to places on this floor by walking any combination of that way and that way from where I'm standing. Or I can get to any place on this floor by doing whatever I can do as long as I don't jump. And they both describe this floor. If I jump, I've gone in the normal direction. That's forbidden. This is all the stuff that is perpendicular to the normal. And now we can see these are sort of the same. So we can find some unity in these two things. So in particular, we can describe a plane in this way. But we can also describe it as everything whose dot product with the normal is zero, shifted by some given point. vectors v so that v dot p and n. Well, actually not quite. Let me let me let me give this position guy some some name. So let's call this v naught. So v naught is oops V naught is my position from the origin to some place on the plane. And so this will really be vectors V so that, so let me, I want my red pen. These are going to be vectors of the form here this way, whatever, if I, so it's these guys, V, so that when I subtract off V naught, then I'm left with something which is normal to N. So this is, I guess I called that A before, didn't I? Not V naught. Where's A? A is there. So I have this vector A here, and so I need that V minus A this vector, which is a point in the plane, has to be perpendicular to my normal vector. Right. Yeah? Wait, don't we not know that that's a point in the plane unless so we know it's perpendicular to the vector? Because V minus A tells So, if I'm given a point in the plane, namely the vector that sticks to the plane somehow, if I take A, so let me redraw this picture because I've sort of trapped it. Let me just draw it again. So here is some vector A that points somewhere in the plane. And then I can describe the rest of the plane as a combination of these two black vectors with A. Or I can say, well, if I take any vector that lands in the plane, like this one, so this is some vector V, that points at some point in the plane, and now I look at V minus A, which is now a vector laying in that plane. V, v minus A doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily laying in the plane. It's, per, it's parallel to something. So, so I'm, no, because v doesn't, doesn't V's, so, the plane, so. Wait, oh, you said V's in the plane? Yes. I mean, it's, it's, it's parallel to the plane. No, we, yeah, don't we check if it's in the plane by multiplying with the normal vector? Like, don't we that Well, way? that's one way. It has to be true, and it can't be true for anything else. So, you can either view it as a condition, or you can view it as a defining property. So, so let, me, let me do an example with actual numbers. If, if we know V is in the plane already, there's not a really... I don't know what V is. V is all points who live in the plane. Then, what, then why would we dot it with N to see if it's in the plane? Okay, so, so let me... Let me Okay, so here I'm going to give you a normal vector 
which is one, two, three. There's a normal vector. Okay. Okay. So that's sum in three space. That's a terrible one to draw. How about one, one, two? That one's easier to draw. One way this way, one way this way, and up two. That's my normal vector. Okay. Now, of course, I can pick this up and drag it around, but now I have a plane. We'll put it up there. This is also, because vectors we can pick up and drag around. They are just displacements. So this is the vector one, one, two. And this is the plane consisting of all vectors which are perpendicular to one, one, two. Right. But there are lots of vectors that are perpendicular to one, one, two. Because I can slide this plane up and down one, one, two. So I have one other condition that my plane contains the point, I don't know, <coughs> uh, zero, one, zero. So let's, this plane well, then that picture's wrong. Um, zero, one, three, two, zero. three. Zero, three, zero. Right. So this cuts through at the point zero, three, zero. Okay. So my plane contains zero, three, zero. Yeah. So now let's describe that plane. So one way I could describe this plane is to find a vector this way and a vector that way. Most what I'm just saying is you said that B minus A necessarily lies in the plane. Yes. Right? But this is A. Yeah, and I get that A lies in the plane, but I feel like you multiply B minus A dot N, you do that in order to see if it equals zero, so you can see if... If I know V. Right, if you know V. But, but if I don't know V... There's not really a point to that if you know that B lies in the you're, plane. You're, you're creating a function whose so only solution are the points that lie in the plane. Right, yeah. So what I'm trying to say is that my plane, so here's some vector v, who lives in the plane, okay? And I'm saying that my plane is described by all vectors v, which is a variable, just like when you write y equals 3x plus 2. Right. You're saying, tell me x, I can tell you how to calculate v. Here I'm saying, I mean what? Here I'm saying, tell me n and tell me a. And we can calculate v by saying, and I'll give a better way to calculate it in a minute, it's any vector v. So this is a variable. Yeah, so I guess what So I'm that, about, let me finish, uh, okay. v minus uh, 0, 3, Zero dotted with one one two equals zero. This is defining v. If you want, you can call v x y and z, which uh, I'll do in just a second. And this will give me equations for x y and z that must hold true. Right. So my v is x y z. And I'm going to switch back to black. And so now I can write equations in terms of x, y, and z that will only be satisfied by those triples x, y, z that satisfy a given condition. Namely, I have to have x minus 0, y minus 3, z minus 0, dotted with 1, 1, 2, has to equal 0. In other words, x plus y minus 3 plus 2z has to equal 0. Now I have a, a slightly more familiar non-vector description of the plane in terms of triples x, y, and z that satisfy this relationship. You see the point now? Yes. Okay. So if I just gave it to you in terms of, so, so this is a restriction. Right? Again, this equation is saying, consider all possible x, y's, and z's. Throw away the ones for which this is false. This is a way to construct it. This is saying, so I can also describe this if I have my other two vectors, saying, here's how you can build anybody who lives in the plane. Start with my vector v, 
take my two vectors, u and w, and add together all combinations of the u and w. So one is a restriction, and the other one is a recipe for building. They're both useful in different contexts. Just like for a line, you usually write y equals some slope times x plus something else. This is a restriction. But if we write it this way, go to this point, and then move in that direction, it's a recipe for constructing. This one is sort of inside, and this one is describing what is not outside. And since the complement of outside is inside, they give us the same thing. And they're both useful in two different contexts, or depending on the situation. So in general, the form of the equations of a plane in free space are going to be of the form x minus, I don't know, x naught plus minimum. Let's, let's write it. ax plus by plus cz equals infinity. And all I did is I took that other equation over there and I gathered together all the coefficients and I threw them on the other side and blah, blah, blah. And we can divide through by one of these. Right? If you want, you can divide out one of them. So I don't really have four things. I really have four. Right. A could be a zero. As long as A isn't zero. Yeah. One of them isn't zero. So you can pick one of them and divide it out. Yes. It's a three-dimensional thing, so we expect to have three degrees of freedom to describe it. But if one of them is zero, I can't divide by it, obviously. Just like with a line, right? Usually, you know, you could say that a line in R2 is ax plus by equals c, and you can get rid of one of these as long as it's not zero. And then you get rid of the other. Okay. So now mm, let's use that notion see if we can figure out, I don't know. So we can use these kinds of ideas to figure out things like, well, let's do something simple first. So say I have some line at some point P. So here's my line L. And maybe it's in three space, maybe it's not. And here's my point E. And I want to figure out this distance. Now, L, let's say, is all vectors of all things of the form, I don't know, Q plus T times V. Let's think of it that way rather than the normal thing. And how would I figure out that distance? Uh, you might have the colors. So you already did this, actually, on the homework problem. I just did it a minute ago. But make a line perpendicular. Then? What's scalar? You mean this? Yeah. So, so strictly, so here, let's, let's do this as a problem. Make this an actual problem. Let's see if somebody can solve it. So this is the point two, three, four, and this is the line one, one, one. It's a vector plus uh, t times one zero one. Okay. So what do we do to calculate the distance? Zero. 
So you're saying take some point. So where does this guy? It's not even a point. Is that So where is XYZ in this picture? XYZ would be any other point on the main line that you drew? Well, so since you did 2, 3, 4, yeah. then that's saying it's perpendicular. This, uh, where's my origin? Uh, 1, 1, 1. Let's say my origin is somewhere here. You're saying it's perpendicular to this vector. XYZ would be a coordinate on that green line. And then, so, oh, I see. You're saying this vector. Okay. Yes. So this vector here is the vector x minus 2. Okay, that should work. So that should work. Right? So, so that would work. Did you have a different one? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, there's a dot that just know what plus t101 this exists on both lines. Mm -hmm. like, so the line should be 101 plus t101 minus 234. That should be the another vector. Uh -huh. and it's dot uh, dot one four one one. It's zero. So you're saying one 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 plus t one let's zero. just do it this way. T zero t t yeah minus two three four Dot, uh, so that will be a vector thing. along this line. Yeah. The whole dot. Yeah. The whole thing. Dot multiple all one. It's zero. Okay. This, this should be the same problem. Yeah. This should be the same. Exactly. But Another way you can do it. Just in this way, you only need to figure out what t is of three unknown numbers. There should be. Like, well, there's even another way you can do it. I mean, they're all the same. But not really the same. Yeah. Uh, if you subtract the one 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 from both the line and the point, so that the line ends up going through the origin. Okay. And then you take the vector to the new point. Uh huh. And find its um, projection onto yeah. the line, and then you subtract the projection from the vector. Right. So these are all sort of equivalent, but maybe it's not obvious there. So let me say what he said, because this is, this is sort of the way I think of it. These are all fine. I think this is the most computationally effective way, but what really matters is that you can conceptualize the problem in a way that enables you to solve it and remember how to solve it, not memorizing formula. So what he suggested, let me just draw the picture again. So here's 1, 1, 1. Here's the origin. Here's my 1, 0, 1. Obviously, this is not the scale. And here's my point 2, 3, 4. And I think what you suggested, please tell me if I'm wrong, is look at the vector from the point 1, 1, 1 to 2, 3, 4 and project it onto the vector 101. And that gives you this piece. And then subtract it away. It's exactly the problem that we started the class with. So that is, if I take 2 minus 1, 3 minus 1, 4 minus 1, and dot it with 1, oh, 1, and then divide it by the length of 1, oh, 1. That will give me this red length. And I want to turn it into a vector in the 1, oh, 1 direction. So that will be, this is in the direction 1, oh, 1 divided by the length of 101, which is the square root of 2. So this is really a 2 on the bottom. That's the red vector. 
And now I can just compute the green vector minus the red vector to get the vector this length I want. Length of green minus red is what I want. These are all, if you think about them long enough, they're all the same. But I think it's worth realizing that there are sort of three seemingly different, or four or twelve, just seemingly different ways of attacking this same problem. And they're all okay. So there's nothing wrong with this. There's nothing wrong with this. There's nothing wrong with any of them. Just, you should think about the problem, conceptualize it, and, make, and, and it should work. So I'm not going to finish this calculation because I'll probably mess it up and then I'll be embarrassed and cry. This won't be fun. Okay. What about the situation where I have some plane and I have some point and I want to find the distance? What would I do? Now certainly one thing I can do 
is I can write n as x, y, z, and I can write, yeah, I can write n as x, y, z, and this will give me an equation in three variables, and this will give me an equation in three variables. I solve those two linear equations simultaneously, I'm left with an equation in one variable, which will tell me n. Well, it will tell me a direction, and I can choose any value. Right, so I could do that, but it's not very efficient. Is this clear that I could do that? Right, so I could just take x, y, z dotted with u, x, y, z dotted with v, set them both to zero, solve them simultaneously, get rid of one of the variables, and I'll get something like z equals, uh, well, I'll get some relation here among them. I can do that. I can get z in terms of f of x and y, which will be a linear relation, and then I pick any one value and away I go. I don't really want to do that, because that's sucky. So there's a very useful thing that only works in three dimensions. It doesn't work in higher dimensions. There are analogs of it in higher dimensions. It is also, so we have this inner product or this dot product. We have another way to combine vectors called the cross plot. Which has some horrible formula that I can never remember. Which, so we write this as u cross v. And it works kind of like a product, except it is not commutative. Yeah? It's not a determinant of the number. That's what I'm going to do now. Oh. <laughs> Which comes down to doing this. So yeah, I could do that. So I'm just letting you know, because I can't remember the formula. I can guess at the formula, and I'll probably get a sign on. Because it's going to be, well, here, I wrote it in my notes. And then I'll answer. It is, so u2, so u is u1, u2, u3, and v is Maybe I should call it W so that it doesn't look like a U. W1, W2, W3, and then the formula is U2, W3, right? Yeah. Minus U3, W1, W2. Yes, comma. Don't memorize this because you blow it just like me. Um, the one that doesn't involve the two, and who comes first? Still you. U3, W1 minus U1, W3. And then the last one must be U2. That's not right. I did that one. U1, V1, W2. U1, W2 minus U2. W1. So that's the definition. It's horrible. Um, but, as he said, uh, how many of you have seen this before? How many of you have not seen this before? Okay. So, if you took physics, you saw this before. And if you didn't, you didn't. Um, maybe you didn't. Anyway. Another way, an easier way to remember this relies on knowing determinants a little bit, but mnemonically, it's the determinant of, so I introduced this notation a little bit, but I didn't use it. Um, we put i, j, and k along the top. We put use components here, and we put all use components here. I will talk more about the determinant in a bit, and then we calculate the determinant of this matrix, which means that we take the products this way. So we take this product gives me in the i component u2. So let me just multiply, let me do it separately so I can remember it. We multiply everything uh, right so in the down diagonal. This way, so that the, okay, let me 
let me just write it this way. I, U1, W1, J, U2, W2. So I multiply these ways and, I, and then I subtract off multiplying these other ways. Okay, so I would get I, U2, W3, plus J, U3, W1, plus K, U1, W2, and then I subtract off I, going the other way, here, 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 so I, U3, W2, J, U1, U1, W3, K, whatever the hell it is, U2, W1. And that gives me that. So once you get used to it, it's not so bad. You have I, so let me do an example with numbers. So suppose I want a vector perpendicular to 1, 2, 3, and 1, 0, negative 1. So then I would just write I, J, K, 1, 2, 3, 1, 0, negative 1, and then I would calculate the determinant, which is going to be in the first component, which is I, 2 times negative 1 is negative 2, and then I subtract off 3 times 0. In the J component, I take 1 times negative 1, which is negative 1, and I subtract off, did I get the sign wrong here? No, no. And I subtract off 3 times 1, and then in the K component, I take 1 times 0, minus 2 times 1. Minus 2. Two times one is usually two, you're correct. <laughs> uh, so this would be negative two, negative four, negative two. And we should check that this really works. Negative two times, that's negative two plus two. So it's certainly perpendicular with this one if I take the dot product. And if I take the dot product with this one, I get negative two. So I get negative two minus eight is minus 10. And then, I have a sign wrong somewhere. Is my middle sign wrong? Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. I'm supposed to swap the sign. Um, okay, so then I get minus 2, minus 3 is, and minus 6 is 8, and 2 times 4 is 0, so that works. And I got the sign wrong here too, right? These are both signs. Yeah, because when I take a determinant, I'm supposed to alternate sign. So, sorry I messed that up, but there it is. Um, so when you take the determinant, every other row is plus, minus, plus, minus. We will talk more about determinants when we talk more about matrices and things like that. Sorry I screwed up. But anyway, you can also just solve these equations, but that's a long, complicated process. So, what is the point of this? Well, it enables us to, given a pair of vectors, find a vector perpendicular to it quite readily. And so we can now switch back and forth from this form to the form involving the normal quite easily. Because we can find the normal vector by taking the dot product. Now, one thing, I mean the cross product. One property of the cross product, though, is that it is not commutative. That is, V cross W is not the same as W cross V. It's anti-commutative. That is, if you swap the order, the sign changes. That corresponds to, in this matrix formula, swapping the position of these two vectors, these, these two rows, 
which changes the sum. Geometrically, if I have a vector v here and a vector w here, then the vector v cross w will be up here. And w cross v will be down there. So this is called the right hand rule. I mentioned this before. If I put my hand along V, curl it towards W, my thumb points in the V cross W direction. I put my hand on the V vector, curl my fingers towards W. I put my right hand. If you do it with your left hand, it won't work. Put my right hand on V, curl it towards W, my thumb points in V cross W. If I do it with my left hand, it hurts too much to try. Put my hand in curl, ouch. But if I do it this way, then it points the wrong way. Right? Yeah. Uh, can you generalize that method for finding the determinants and matrices to the higher dimensional matrices? Yeah. Sort of. It's, I mean, the cross product really only works in, in three dimensions. You can generalize this kind of thing, but so it only works as long as the numbers just come out blood. So that, that's like assuming like we're talking about actual space, but mathematically. Well, so I mean, we can let's say no for the moment. You had a question or a statement or something? Yeah, I was wondering. Uh, is well, so, kind of. So not really. I mean, there's, there's a, there's, so here, this is in R3, we can define quaternions that have a non-commutative multiplication, but they, that's a four-dimensional space. It's kind of like a generalization of, but it's not really a cross product. But you have something similar where if you put the two and put the other one out. Right here, if we think about the i cross j is k, where this is the unit vector along x, this is the unit vector along y, this is the unit vector along z, and j cross k is i, so they sort of go around in a circle, and for the quaternions, we can also throw in one. So if we have one i, j, and k, so then we have four mutually perpendicular dimensions, then we can make an algebraic structure out of this. It's called, sometimes called the Hamiltonians. Uh, they're sort of, in the same way that there's an algebra for two vectors called the complexes, there's an algebra for four vectors called the Hamiltonians. Um, and there, the multiplication operator is not commutative. And you can even go to octonians where you also lose associativity. So you can, you can do sort of an algebraic structure with one number, with two numbers, which is the complexes, with four numbers, which is the Hamiltonians and the octonians. But as you go up more and more, you keep losing more and more of the standard operations that you expect to work. So if you go to octonians, you don't have associativity. But that's not in this class. Um, are we okay with this? All right. All right. Uh, so, so one thing that this is useful for is for us to construct perpendicular vectors, which can be handy when we want to project stuff and find distances and find equations of planes and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, it also, which has to do, it has to do with uh, this determinant property. It also um, notice that I didn't use anything about the length of v cross w. I just said v cross w is a vector that goes that way, and this length could be quite long, um, but. Oh, yeah, so, no, I have that. So, another sometimes useful thing 
if I have three vectors, u, v, and w, so those are supposed to be vectors in three space. They are not any of them perpendicular. You can notice that they sort of design, define a prism. I tilted over box. My picture is terrible. Something's wrong here. That one's too long. So I have a box like that whose sides are u, v, and w. And certainly, if I calculate v cross w, this gives me something in Systems of 
linear equations. So if I have some system of equations like that, then I have three equations and three unknowns, so I will either have no solution, or I will have a whole plane or line or something, I'll have infinitely many solutions, or I'll have exactly one solution. And probably many of you have encountered these kinds of things, in, and, and maybe you, you even know something about writing this in terms of matrices to five. Right, does this look, how, who does this not look familiar to? A few of you. Okay, it's all right. Don't worry. So, and there's a close relationship. These are actually vectors and transformations of vectors. If we think of this x, y, z as a vector, which could be a 3 vector, it could be a 12 vector, I don't care. And we think of this as a vector. And this is a function that tells me I put in a vector, and out comes another vector, and that vector will involve x's and y's and z's. Here is that vector. And when I set an equal, I'll get another vector. So we can recast this problem about systems of equations in terms of vectors and transformations on the vectors. Or in the context, if you prefer, of a matrix times a vector equals another vector. And one of the main points, one of the main uses of this idea of linear algebra is seeing that these two questions, thinking about vectors as describing geometric objects in space and thinking about vectors as describing systems of equations, are the same question. And we need to do this kind of thing, well, that kind of thing, to do calculus in higher dimensions, but a lot of times this kind of jump falls out of it too. And so what I'm going to do on Monday is talk about the relationship, at least briefly, between messing with vectors and transformations of vectors and systems of equations. Okay, because these are really the same question. And really when people realize that these were the same question is why this field of linear algebra was developed because it's the same thing. Just like thinking about lines and thinking about linear functions is the same thing. Okay? So, this is a good time to stop. So, let me stop there. Um, right, so, there I will, there I will put another homework assignment up. Sorry, I'll put The one that we do today is there, and, and the next one will be up within 24 hours and maybe within one. Can I forget about it? Of course I can forget about it. It's still due next week, but I can forget about it if you like.